article. Well, many of his articles, aside from ratification article, is that you can't understand dialectical materialism unless you understand chiefly Kant, secondarily Spinoza and Leibniz. And people who call themselves Marxists who don't know what how you situate him uh, are essentially pissing in the wind. They're not really engaging the problem that Marx had to engage, and the other and and Wilcox had to engage, and many others, uh, although hardly any in the United States. And he starts with ratification. And in fact, I noted that he has a, a huge discussion of ratification, but actually uh, uh, nails it down twice in one sentence, in single sentences. What, what is ratification? Um, I, I think that um, reification is the thinification of human relationships. That's it it's is. like the, the commodification of relationships and it reflects the, the, the it, it reflects the commodity as Marx started capital with. And, and are you second building that? Not all production is commodities, and production can be both commodified and non-commodified without really discussing what it is that people do in any detail, what non-commodity production is in our societies, or it may not have been in 1923 in Hong What is non-production of, of goods? Can you give an example of this? Or did you did you read it and say, I better find out? I'll go to class and find out. The non-capitalist production of goods or the, the non-industrial non production it's of goods? It's the same thing, non-commodity non production. Non-commodity. Well, capitalism implies commodification. So these would be pre-capitalist pre forms. Yes. Yeah. They still exist. That still exist yeah. mm. oh. primitive societies. What in primitive, primitive society? No, and they still exist. This is 2019. Oh, mm. I would say that when I like scrambled eggs in the morning for myself, mm. no, that's leave, <laughs> leave the home alone. Probably. <laughs> yeah. What are non-commodified forms of production? The family. Yeah. All right. Let's leave that alone. That's too. Uh, leave that one. Too. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking long for the yeah. moment. Personal relationships? Yeah, I mean, that's, do we have any to speak of? He doesn't think we have yeah, personal relationships mark the society. There may be individual relationships here and there that are personal, genuinely per personal. But by and large, all of our relationships are commodified, are about money. By and large, the political animal uh, of the left, and maybe even of the right, that may not be true. But, but what what products of of uh, of group values prior to our post to our post commodity still exist and in some <coughs> places in the in the United States as well as in other advanced countries I'm not going to go to other societies for the moment where do they exist? And what is it that, that, that they are? 
Maybe it's the price of urban living. Even in urban living, however, non-commodities are produced for use. It seems to me that I mean that like there is small you know, voluntary communities which millions of people in this country. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands in Britain. Millions of people in France have gardens where they grow vegetables mm -hmm. and fruits. Mm -hmm. As well as flowers, mm -hmm. but vegetables and fruits which they eat. That's not a commodity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's production for you. What else? And now I'm just talking about uh, products that are not human products initially, which are still human products uh, ultimately. Anywhere. All right, I'll, I'll start now. Mm -hmm. We're making our hats. Which they don't sell. So and again, I'm sorry, what? I put them on top of their own head. Hats? She makes her own hats. Mm. So, knitting, so knitting or sewing? Knitting. I well, knitting or sewing. Okay. Right, but Art. repairing is not counted. You can repair a uh, dry cleaning store bring your garment to a dry cleaning store and you can get it repaired. Or people go uh, repair at home. But as a product, they have to make something. They make shirts, they make, my mother made sweaters for me. Um, of course, I don't wear hats. Um, generally, I don't wear hats. Um, Um, people make furniture, they still do. Cabinet makers. Cabinet people who make cabinets who are not cabinet makers, but who learn how to do it and then make cabinets, make chairs. For self-use. What? For self-use. Self-use, yes. And when he says that pre-capital societies also produce commodities, the distinction he makes is what? It's remained in the individual realm. No, that's not the, the, thing, the distinction he makes. No, it didn't always, become the generalized. That's right. It has a, you, the word he uses is universal. Universalized. Um, the commodity form, he said, exists in pre-capital and generally pre-capitalist societies in the early stages of capitalism, episodically, uh, mm -hmm. as episodes, mm -hmm. which are not built into the rhythm of the society. When, the, when commodities become universal, what does that mean for a Lukács? is that it also becomes part of our social relations. That's it. But <laughs> not also. It, it is part universal. of our, it is it our social relations. The word he uses is penetrates our social relations. 
Why so much emphasis on rarefication? Because the penetration of our social relations with reification is what creates the sense of powerlessness and passivity before change. Yes, but, but in the general phrase, when the form penetrates the social relations, what happens is that the structure of society itself has become commodified, including most personal relations. The word personal relations is in some respects antiquated. Yeah, page uh, 85 is a very nice sentence that, uh, that, that does this too. Yeah. However, even when commodities have this impact on the inter internal structure of the society, this does not suffice to make them constitutive of that society. To achieve that would be necessary, as we emphasized above, for the commodity structure to penetrate society in all its aspects and to remold it in its own image. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 It's not enough merely to establish an external link with independent processes concerned with the production of exchange values. The qualitative difference between the commodity as one form among many regulating the metabolism of human society and the commodity as the universal structuring principle has effects over and above the fact that the commodity relation as an isolated phenomena exerts a negative influence at best on the structure and organization. The distinction also has repercussions upon the nature and the validity of the category itself. Where the commodity is universal, it manifests itself differently from the commodity, as you were saying. And Stanley was saying it's a particular, isolated, non-dominant phenomenon. Until, yeah. Yeah. at the graduate center, until I taught a, a course in capital, David Harvey did not teach the first chapter of capital. Because he, did, he didn't believe that the first chapter of Capital was relevant to Marx's theory of capitalism. Or if it was relevant, it was a minor relevance. He always teaches it now. Yeah. Which is good. But many, but many courses in Marxism, and I wonder whether the, uh, the, the, the left uh, uh, communists in uh, Germany, which have 300 courses in capital, I wonder whether those 300 study groups in capital study the first chapter. That would probably depend on whether they're Althusserians or not, too. Well, well in some but, ways. But not only Althus there. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, but it's Stalin. Yeah, Stalin, too. Right. And yeah, sure. Lenin never had a theory of ratification. No, I know. Yeah. Yeah. And it is as if he never read chapter one. Well, it was a great, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're on to something here in the sense that, you know, what's really being denied by the people you're mentioning is the social relations of production. Yeah. yeah. That they're only interested in forces of production and that mobilization, and there's never really been an attempt to to conceptualize the social relations of, of, of capital, or as Marx said in you know, what we read at the beginning, to build the world in its own image, the bourgeois class, right? The yeah, class of replace. Uh, Lenin said yeah. um, that we can have no problem with the capitalist factory as a school for worker. He teaches them the discipline is necessary. He liked Taylor very much. He read Taylor very actively yeah. and used him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gramsci is soft on Taylor. He's soft. So he, he is soft on Taylor, <laughs> so that's right. He, he is, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Gramsci is a right wing communist, or he's actually a centrist. Yeah. Uh, not in that where you would not know unless you read Gramsci much closer than most people read him. He was a uh, his, his prison letters and his, and his uh, 
correspondence, which is before he went to jail, is all full of this conversation about the factory system. Not that it will be with us forever, but we have to see, we have to keep it because it will teach workers discipline and it will en 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 enhance productivity. Um, Lenin and Stalin unconsciously went to adoption. <laughs> because they reflect some of that thinking. Stalin too late and into the 30s and 40s. In fact, if we don't examine social relations as an aspect of bourgeois consciousness and bourgeois philosophy, I mean the small p, not just the, uh, the profession, if you don't examine social uh, in the factory that way, we don't understand social relations politically. Social relations form the class system. And the word hierarchical, which appears in Lukács and in very few of the, of the Marxists of the interwar period, the word hierarchical disappears. Because what is true about the factory system is that it is, among other things, and even in the first instance, especially in the old uh, Fordist assembly line, it is hierarchical. There are managers, there are technicians who, are, who work in uh, um, non-hierarchical circumstances, although they, the technicians can be part of the productive apparatus and therefore afforded. But the concept of, a, of, of bourgeois social relations either disappears or is relegated to a footnote. But when Lukács brings it, and that's why uh, Negri is hostile to Lukács, hostile. Because Negri doesn't want to deal with social relations either. He has no detailed understanding. I'm not saying what he knows personally, but he has no detailed understanding of the relationship between technology, except in one place, which is in insurgents, uh, so between technology and, and, and surplus value. The development of technology is now more or less completely, that is commercially, completely commercially informed. Very few inventors exist who have the means to uh, do technology as a non-commodified uh, performance. Very few. Well, hence the language of the, you know, the startup. You know, the new entrepreneur. The academic is entrepreneur is the new thing too. Right. Uh, searching for <coughs> equity. <laughs> right. So this is the new, you know, the new concept. Of, you know. The the academic the academic um, managers are so full of technology it dominates every word every sentence that they that they uh, that, that they enunciate. Right. Technology can appear twice or three times in one sentence. Right. And what they need to do is to transform the curriculum so that it uh, enhances technological change. But also the curriculum is being determined by the ad astra systems because it's based on numerical and algorithmic value, right. not on pedagogical or necessary mm -hmm. value anymore. It's all based on numbers in the room. This is right. actually this. Sports, baseball. Too. Yeah, yeah, like uh, statistics analytics, and yeah. analytics and baseball. Velocity you know, you remember, you know, we used to talk yeah. about this, why they pull the pitcher after 80 pitches. Yeah. When we were growing yeah. up, it's like 130 or yeah, Dizzy yeah, Dean yeah. would go, you know, 13 innings. Today, the guys are out after the fifth inning because the arm is an investment that's calculated through the salary. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> 
Rocky Center has something that. in the neighborhood of 75 members of the sociology graduate faculty. If you uh, asked for someone to teach today the technology of capitalism, technology, said that nobody. Mm. Nobody. Give, nobody. Give it to Juan Battles, then. Huh? Give it to Juan Battle. Give it to Juan Battle. <laughs> right. Make it into another set of statistics. Another set of statistics. Mm. And what they call mathematics is essentially statistics. Or as the students say, sadistics. <laughs> <laughs> it is sadistics. <laughs> And most of the students know that um, statistics is really a prelude to doing simple mathematical uh, research, mathematical based social research. Um, I have had a student who I still see on a regular basis, Dan Douglas, who's very good in statistics and can do it and can get a job in statistics in sociology almost any time he wants and he's trying to avoid it. He's now yeah. teaching at, um, what's it called, up in Hartford, Trinity, Trinity College. College. Yeah. And he teaches um, not statistics at all. And they're saying to him, do some statistics courses and you can get a job maybe here. He refuses. But he may have to capitulate and say he does statistics to a job in application. Yeah. When I tell students and my, fa and my faculty colleagues that aside from my factory work <coughs> for nine years, I never applied for a job when I became an academic and when I became a, a social uh, manager at Mobile Safety for years. First thing, they don't believe me. Secondly, if they believe me, they're entirely uh, mesmerized and befuddled. You were too easy. you were too late to defend yourself. Maybe I can on TV. You've been you. hmm? <laughs> You've been expelled from the bar. Yeah. <laughs> Vyshinsky speaks. <laughs> what did I do now? You just came late. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. No. Was it was it schoolwork? A lot of things. We're okay. Could you um, help me understand the antinomies of bourgeois thought a little? I think that's what you're maybe referring to when it is. Why don't you get from it? More antinomies. <laughs> what does an antinomy mean? It's like um, contradictions yeah. within, unreconcilable, yeah. absolute. Contradiction. Do you have a copy of the critique here? You have a copy of the pure reason, right? I'll show it to people. Yeah, I have two copies. Two copies. Two copies. Two translations. Two translations. You have Pluhar, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else on the concept of. Uh, Let's see if I can find it. As Lukacs uses it, or anybody who uses it in relationship to more work or social thought? No? You know, you're not doing any reading? Of course. But you've missed that one? I'm late, I have to catch up. Got to catch up in the read. No, in the group. Well, the group seems peculiarly science. So I, don't know. I thought it was, um, I thought that, I'm not sure I really grokked the totality of that um, chapter. And probably because, as you said, my education in Kant is, and basic philosophy is deficient. Um, but I, I was, I, I read it closely and I thought that what he was saying was really incredibly important. Yeah, it is. 
and I really, I really loved where he counterposes on a granular level, capitalism appears to be highly rational, everything according to empiric rules and laws. But when you put it all together, it's a big mess. It's a mess, and I think he quotes Engels saying that the natural laws of capitalism are basically the laws of chance. Just throw up a bunch of shit and see where it falls, and that's what you get. There's so there's there's that contradiction. Well, you, you, could, you could say that there is a contradiction between uh, uh, the notion which economists agree to that uh, the economy operates on the principle of chance and their pretensions concerning prediction. That there was a, a discipline called political economy which due to its mastery of statistical methods or mathematical methods they call can predict events in the capitalist uh, world order or in each sector of the economy. Um, needless to say, in many in many cases they are dead wrong because they were they were even bought and paid for, either consciously or unconsciously, by the social order. One one of, one of these one of these people is Paul Krugman, who is ostensibly a liberal, a uh, follower uh, traditionally of uh, John Maynard Keynes, who does both prediction of catastrophe and assurance on continued growth. He does this almost in the same article regularly. But, but the most important one is the one that uh, you came close to talking about. We have the appearance now of full, uh, full employment. But many companies, including Walmart, employ people, don't call them part-timers, but employ people in so-called full-time jobs at 28 hours because at 30 hours they have to pay unemployment. So on one hand, you have the appearance of full employment and the actuality of a lot of uh, partial unemployment. Um, what other antinomies can you think of? But the general antinomy is really between appearance and essence. Rarely, if ever, do bourgeois econ economists, whether it be from the uh, Friedman School, which is a distortion of Adam Smith, uh, call itself the free market economy, economists, and you, 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 you rarely find them developing a uh, coherent theory of capitalism which is not based on empirical evidence. To, to have a theory not based on uh, uh, empirical evidence Harris. means a lot. You get laughed out of the profession. Yeah. Not necessarily. I don't. I mean, we, seem you know, huh? we seem to worship empirical evidence. We seem to worship empirical evidence. You're right, but there are statistics. Some yes, but what does it mean not to uh, base your theory of capitalism, quite apart from prediction, on something other than empirical evidence? It means that you're an analyzing from a different standpoint with a different form of thought. You're not analyzing from the standpoint of the owner, you're analyzing from the standpoint of the worker. 
Well, that would be a that would be a a, a, a materialist dialectical move. Um, but it wouldn't be the general theory of capitalism. So you you're you're not looking at you're not looking at history. You're not looking at That's true, but what but make a statement about it. I'm sorry to be uh, uh, arbitrary. Make a statement about it, not about you know, looking at history. History is one point of the statement. History, uh, I mean, um, capitalism is a system which derives its surplus from the transformation of the peasant, or the would-be peasant, from a small property owner or a uh, sharecropper into a wage laborer. According to Marx, wages are a form of slavery. And Jose Dolores in the film. And, Burn. and Jose Dolores in the form in the film uh, Burn. Yes. Which is a wonderful statement. Jose Dolores says a man remains the slave if he has to work for another. <laughs> <laughs> when you have, for example, the professoriate in advanced capitalist countries, as that was true both in France and England and the United States, to begin with. When you have a professoriate who's living is based on wage labor, in most cases, uh, bequeathed upon the uh, worker by, uh, by by the wage system and by grants which are ordinarily um, bequeathed by either the government or private corporations. You have companies. The uh, worker, the worker's property is not, generally speaking, for the purpose of sale of a mere commodity. It's often for the purpose of use. use before sale. And when there is sale, it's marginal to the worker's existence. My older daughter is the best tomato grower in the United States, although she is not as good a tomato grower as some places in Western Europe, like France. They have a little longer history. What? They have a little longer history doing it. <laughs> that's it. That, that, and and, and true. maybe the soil. land, the soil is the pretty good there too. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> that's true. But, but yeah. not even that's where true. the soil is better, uh -huh. and the tomato is better in the United States. That's right. right. That's true. Mm -hmm. Because they're all based on productivity, yeah. right. getting the proper, get, getting the product out to the market as fast as possible. Even the heirloom ones. I'm sorry. Even the heirloom tomatoes. Yeah. But I have good news for you. In in the Catskills, you're going to be receiving good tomatoes because Pierre Adler has returned to his uh, New Paltz residence and will bring you those big heirlooms. As well, you know, my my. You know, your friend, my cousin Katie's. Yeah, she, <laughs> well, has, very well, good she has very good tomatoes. They're growing in the garden. She, she, but she grows them for use. Yes, for use. Yes, absolutely. She's yeah. not worried about No, they, they already have uh, enough. Right, they don't need to sell the tomatoes. Just so. What other questions? Nothing else? How does Kant resolve the problem of the antinomy of bourgeois thought? This is about 90 pages of this book, by the way. <laughs> I got found it on the shelf. So this is where Lukács is getting it from, is, is a section called the Transcendental uh, Dialectic. That's the thing in itself discussion? Yes, and it's on uh, the antinomy of pure reason. Discussion. It begins, yeah, not only the thing in itself, it's also on 
it's also on cosmology and other things to be fair to Kant, but you know, it, yes, it goes into the thing in itself and the distinction between appearance and essence. So this is in book two, chapter two of the critique of uh, pure reason called the transcendental uh, uh, dialectic, and it's called the section is entire section is the antinomy of pure reason, but it's developed is you know in many many parts. And um, yeah. Before you get to the notion of the ideal, you have to resolve the end. But, but Lukács is obviously taking the concept of antinomy, not working this out as a cosmological or you know argument at all. Yeah, it's bringing it back down to earth. You have you have a thing in itself. consists of the thing in itself. How do we get any? scientific notion of any object which is grown, which is cultivated, which is human, everything from human beings to um, tomatoes. I don't understand that. If you have, you know, if you have a thing in itself, thing in itself is in principle unknowable. Mm -hmm. And it begins with, we cannot know by observation Thank you. So he has to solve the problem by creating a fundamental antinomy. He being Luca. No, Kant. 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 Yeah. yeah. Through indirect means, mm -hmm. the, the, the thing in itself can be known because it becomes integrated into the forms, which can be known as the products of intuition. Integrated can be phenomenalized. Yeah. 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 Products of intuition meaning products of our senses. Products of our senses is a sense. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. We know things. Mm -hmm. What we know is appearances. But if we want to get to the essence, the, the, the essence does not exist externally to, to consciousness. The essence exists in consciousness, in and consciousness thought of as as universal. That we have um, an interior an interior uh, form which is to a large extent not available to us to our sensibility mm -hmm. to our sense. It becomes available to us through scientific experiment. If you ask any scientist, aside from Richard Blevins, who's dead, if you ask any scientist, what is the scientific method, they will say it consists of two parts. One is the products of our senses, <coughs> which are integrated, and they won't use the word <coughs> in the thing in itself, which are integrated into the substance, the nature of the thing through mathematics. Physics becomes the, the queen or, or king of the sciences because it doesn't have to have any observation except the, the, the sensible observation. And through mathematics, it arrives at certainty. What that definition forgets is the imagination. Unsmach may have been 
a hopeless bourgeois philosopher of But as I mentioned before, before you've been mentioned multiple times. I just got a text from the BSC meeting. What? You've been mentioned multiple times at the New Caucus meeting. I just got a text cut? to that effect, yes, about you, you, your name oh, was no, evoked Kant, at Kant, Kant, Kant. No, not as Kant, Kant. I know, <laughs> I'm just saying your name was mentioned. It was, you know, in what, in, uh, if you multiple know, times. He didn't say what context, what, but what, at the meeting. What content? <laughs> what, what, yeah, I don't it. know the content or the context. All you he have just, to do is stand there, there around him and he'll tell you how many times he's been mentioned. <laughs> multiple could be <laughs> Multiple could be four. anywhere from, uh, uh, yeah. Can't be three. Yes, can't be three. Yeah. So you it's said that intuition. leads out the imagination. Okay. Right. Yes, that leads out the message. Mathematical. Mathematical, yeah. pure mathematical reasoning. Well, see, in classical uh, history of science, the way it works is that experimental science fails to... Mention that. You mentioned you again. I wish we'd stop. What? Article 2 of the contract, you were mentioned in the context. And the need for an education committee. That was all. Uh, so far, <laughs> I mean, who knows how much this stupid the stupid thing is young. I'm going to turn it off. I don't want to hear it anymore. Yes. But maybe if we'll leave it on for you. But more important than my name here is <laughs> that uh, physical, chemical, biological science hits a dead end to experimental science. This is the theory of change. And so, at that one moment, a physicist, a chemist, a biologist, from whatever source, um, solves the problem through the exercise, exercise of imagination, namely Einstein's theory of relativity. And usually, the way it works is they either borrow or <coughs> both. They borrow from philosophy. In the case of Einstein, it was Ernst Bach, a 19th century physicist and philosopher. Or they borrow from failed scientific experiment, which they then work out or work through and come up with a solution. And the one that has been often cited for um, particle physics is the Michelson Morley, Morley experiment, which came up with antinomy. <coughs> and uh, it was Einstein who solved the problem by exci excising any fixed object. He mm -hmm. did it by with the first object he used. Yeah. He could have read his marks, but he read his mark. <laughs> <laughs> he had two out of four of the of the, of the correct uh, uh, work of uh, his name. Mark is M A. C H Mark is M A R X. <laughs> but it took imagination. So if we then devise a series of experiments which do not entail the fixed object, but you deny the fixed object to begin with and look for a substitute to explain what it is that the system consists of, you get modern science, which parallels uh, Marx's theory of capitalism, but it's not necessarily derivative of it. And, and, uh, um, Darwin had a theory of evolution, or seems a, um, a, a, bio, a biologist, but he did not have a theory of transformation except the evolutionary theory. It could not explain the actual theory itself in um, relative terms. And the Soviets, who were uh, 
thought they were Marxists, but were actually Newtonians, denied the theory when it came out, even after 1920, when it was confirmed by the Physics Society, and carried Newtonian physics into the 1930s. But uh, aside from that, on the side of them, a whole group of Soviet physicists agreed with, uh, with Einstein and tried to convince the Central Committee and the Academy uh, on Einstein's theory, which was that this a central theory is that measurement depends on conditions of time and space. That uh, a fixed object, if it exists, cannot predict, uh, cannot measure um, a, move, a moving object accurately, only to only probabilities. That there's no precision possible until you have a general theory. That's what he said in 1905. But it wasn't until the 1930s that he began to work on the general theory of relativity, which was to put everything up to chance, if you want to use that word, up to context, and try to derive a theory of general of relativity as a general theory applying to everything. And, he, he, and he, he, had, he claimed that he succeeded. We, we all know working with relative objects. If that is true, I'm going to say something that I think it would be true of Lukács, but would not be true of Negri, with all due respects. Mm -hmm. If that is true, then we can have a, a universal or a general theory of capitalism without citing a single statistic. Without any empiricism. What? Without that's any abstract right. empiricism. Abstract <laughs> empiricism. Right. What we plan to do is ignore history the history of the science in order to fully understand the laws that physics has come up with, that chemistry has come up with, that biology has come up with. Two, two great uh, um, works uh, that are very lucid on this that you're presenting. The Bar Sesson piece that you know well, and of course Christopher Caldwell's The Crisis in Physics. Yeah, it was the Bar Sesson is a piece, mm -hmm. -E -S 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 -E right. It's called. Um, well, it's on Newton. It's, uh, no, it's, it's the origin of Newton. The origin of Newton. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Physics. Right. Right. The yeah. origin of yeah. Newton's physics. physics. Right. Something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Was it root, root causes or something? Mm -hmm. It was first published in 1930. Right. At a conference in London. In London. Right. Of physicists, mm -hmm. and biologists, yeah. primarily. Yeah. And I quoted it in my book, Science is Power. N not to the log of, uh, of, of biophysicists who had not yet, in my opinion, in 1975, when I was invited to MIT to give a talk on this, uh, they had not yet been liberated from uh, Darwin completely. Or physics could not be or Darwin or, or Newton, and the Soviets weren't liberated until virtually the abolition of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. But there were Soviet physicists who took the position of, uh, of Einstein and Marx. There must have been some who were liberated because they couldn't do the calculations of, you know, of their spacecraft or other without you know, incorporating relativity. All you have so to do to see what you have to the world, right? Yeah, right. 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 You have to read Problems of Leninism by Joseph Stalin. And it's all there, all the old shit. 
but it was stated with some elegance, dogmatic elegance, but some elegance. He was not stupid. He was not simply a sneaky tactician, according to the Trotskyists. Of course, the Trotskyists never addressed the problems of science. Never. That's no, true. Yeah. History, yeah. yes. Yeah. Not History and, and literature and literature yeah, and art, science. but never, never science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The leading American scholar, I looked him up one time, I, looked, I, I read his book, but not in great detail, but I, I published the entire book. Um, but not the with physics at all. Bob, yeah, that's the second thing, from UCLA. Scientist? Uh, scientist? A historian? Uh, yeah. huh? A historian of science? You're talking about A very prominent one. Oh. The Charlie Post is simply the pimple on the ass <laughs> of Bob. <laughs> right, right. You're not talking about Brenner. Huh? You're not talking about Brenner. Bob Brenner. Bob Brenner. Okay. I got you. I got you. Okay. Yeah. In my mind, his best books on merchants and revolution. Merchant, it's first. First book. Nice guy. Yeah. 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 First and best, in my mind. Right now. Anyway. Just to give you a um, 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 uh, phrase from Kant. Um, Intuitions are blind without concepts. This was a Kantian right. proposition which runs throughout the, the critique of your reason. And so wonder, it's worth thinking and about in that Kantian level. Intuitions are blind. Well, uh, um, Klein says all theories, are all, uh, all observations are theory made. Mm -hmm which is a very radical view, yeah. even for today's Kantians. Yes. If you choose some aspects of President Trump's two million declarations to characterize him and to understand his presidency. There's a theory that you have enunciated beneath that statement, although it presents itself as an observation. And you would then be obliged for, for Marx to investigate the um, theory that lies beyond that, behind that statement, rather than two million, nine, one million nine hundred ninety-nine thousand statements that you've ignored, or well, I don't necessarily correspond to what you're saying. I do believe that the th that. Trump's theory, although he may not be aware of it or, or, or doesn't think of it as a theory and did not work it out as a theory and then talked about it, that his um, theory of chance is the dominant view of contemporary high politics. We are dealing with chance. And also, we are dealing with chance, and chance requires that we put relative phenomena together to get, to get at the theory. And what those, what those phenomena are, which is really a Kantian idea, what they are requires selection. 
And the selection will tell us more of what we think mm -hmm. than the statement that we have made. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be interesting to see what he would select. Mm -hmm. And here's where you get a, uh, an antinomy. To say of capitalism as a system, the Roosevelt administration and its advisors borrowed from some English economists, including Barry Keynes, a single idea after they were abolished their NRA, National Company Administration, in 1935. Consumption do, uh, drives employment, dri employment derives growth indirectly, consumption um, drives the system. And so what they did is they, they created four million jobs to create income so that the system can grow. Of course, the question of whether a state can provide enough fiction, fictionalized money to create four, th four million jobs even today is questionable. It's difficult. Yeah, spend now, pay later. We can't do it without increasing the debt. Yes, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Trump has said, I don't give a fiddle of stuff about them. Mm -hmm. And Kane said to that question, oh. <laughs> and we're all dead in the long run. 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 We're He was willing to sacrifice debt for jobs. So Trump is the last of the Keynesians? His <laughs> Keynesianism is been missed by all these fools, one of whom is Paul Carter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. He is not permitting the market economy to go its own way. He's declaring He's for lower taxes because lower taxes are going to stimulate investment and employment. He has not been so bold as to create through fictional dollars, fictional meaning you create dollars without an economic base of recognizing the gaps. He won't create fictional do dollars to, to produce jobs. All that you have reduce the rate of interest. <coughs> he will encourage private companies to employ people for not at 40 hours, mm. or, but at 28 hours, uh, at, uh, hours below the, uh, the unemployment rate. So we now have a lot of 28 and 20. 20 is, is part time. But if we have 28 hours, now it's considered full time. If we have 25 hours, it's considered full time. If we have 29 hours, it's considered full time, but not by the federal government. But they're all looking at only two um, variables. One is the amount of the quantity of money in circulation, private and public. And two, the size of the tax, uh, primarily on business and uh, unemployed people, um, capitalists and workers. Those are the two sources. The Keynesian is to actually create 
unemployment through consumption, or mediated, mediated through jobs. What kind of jobs? Filling holes. And then once you fill holes, you dig up the holes. And once you've dug up the holes, you fill them again. That was the New Deal. And I'm using that as a metaphor, not as an annual, although it was, as a... As a Don't you dare use our good cement. <laughs> we have to be back next year. <laughs> Now they talk about the new they talk about the new Keynesianism. What's the new Keynesianism? <coughs> you read the, the military Keynesianism. You read the New York Times? No. You read the Wall Street Journal? No. <laughs> Marx would read both before six o'clock. No, he didn't get up till twelve. <laughs> you know, Times, Wall Street Journal are equivalent on this issue. That is, that employment can be generated by lowering the rate of interest. You have Times, Wall Street Journal. The other point of view, which is, Employment can be generated through direct investment by the government, borrowing from banks in order to create jobs of whatever productivity. That was Roosevelt's view. And he declared a bank holiday to dramatize what had to be done. And the second part of the uh, Keynesian, Keynesian, in addition to creating consumption, is federal programs that pay the unemployed if they are um, jobless against their will and they cannot find another job. And the general formula was, according to the United States Congress Bill of 1935, you should, be, you should retire with 50% of your salary in the last five years of your employment. Because the assumption is, you've already bought your house, you're already 60 years old, um, and you've got savings. But people have fewer and fewer savings in this country. And that gets reported too, by the way. They've used up their savings by borrowing money to pay their mortgage and their rent and their food. Bill. What you call the new Keynesianism isn't that the simply the switch of monetary for fiscal intervention? That's why, but, but, but Keynesian was not a fair monetary policy. But if you're talking about jimmying the interest rates, that's, that's monetary a, policy. That's quantitative. But Keynesian, Keynes was for creating your jobs directly, like borrowing. But there's a strange melange now of a monetarist view with, uh, with a, a new kind of Keynesianism, right? Of which the Republicans have really taken up from Reagan onward. You know, it, it was a switch of allocation. If you remember David Stockton, you know, being in, you know, the, you know, the hatchet man and all the social programs. It was a re, you know, re, remilitarization or reallocation of enormous funds to the military Keynesianism. You know, yeah. With, uh, the the one thing you can say yeah. about the Democrats is that they have a great talent. They can snatch defeat out of the dirty. Right, 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 right. I think they're on the way. Yeah. And the sla slavish supporters of Bernie Sanders and Bernie Sanders himself are really afraid to say that. Right. 
let's return to fiscal policy. You know, and fiscal policy means create jobs through borrowing if necessary. And switch the jobs from the military to the civilian sector because the military sector, although it does produce short term jobs, is a uh, a death sector. It's it's one time. If you have a thirty year or twenty year or ten year um, debt by a state, by a federal state and local government, you've got money coming in for ten years. Twenty years. Thirty years. You supply the military budget year by year, it only lasts for one year. Because they're going to spend every dime you give them. Of course. Of of how much you give them. <laughs> I've got this friend, the Colonel. He needs some extra, <laughs> an extra base. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing about you know all of the campaigns now is. <coughs> including Sanders, says there's nothing about building blocks at all. Building the national transportation system, you know, a new transportation why, system, the techno friendly, why, going against why fossil why fuels. The Republican, yeah. Because the Republicans have taken up that issue. Right, right. It's true, he got a letter from Trump, I saw. Stanley got a letter from Trump? Yeah. Oh yeah, asking him for money. Yeah. Oh good. I yeah. took a picture, I'm an yeah, 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 it's good. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, the, the worst thing will be when Clinton sends him a letter, you know, asking for support. No, that one he'd throw away. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right, now the most difficult question for our session. And that is, what is he talking about when he talks about the subject-object relation? No patch. Yeah. Oh, okay. The subject object relation. What is he talking about? What's that referring to? And what does idealism of the continent variety do with the subject object relation? in a different way. How would you understand relative relativity theory in the context of capitalist social relations and capitalist uh, uh, economics? Um. Well, with relativity, we're always working with relative objects, and measurement depends on conditions of time and space. And in the social world, um, things change. The subject can become an object, and the object can become a subject. And so when we say we are working with what? What did we work? What did you say we were working with? Um, relative objects. Well, what does that mean? Well, you mean you're working with objects which were actually produced by human beings and are understood in the common sense as objects separate from human relations, right? And for the moment that that relationship is in force, where we are, um, where somebody's picking fruit and picking vegetables for market sales, the, sub the, the, the object is the tomato, the subject is the picker, the worker. 
because it is within the capacity of the worker as subject. That is to say, it has subjectivity, that means that they have will to uh, not tur on. turn in the crop unless they modify or abolish capitalist social relations, which underlie the distribution of that crop, crop after it's been picked. The worker said, we built the factory that you are about pulling us in. The worker was the subject, and the factory was the object. But when the capitalist calculates investment decisions, the worker becomes the, the object, and the capitalist becomes the subject. Of course, the capitalist has control of making the decisions which affect social relations. The workers become subject in a certain respect also when they negotiate the conditions of their own employment, whether it be health care or wages or death benefits or um, uh, pension. They're because they're in, they're subjectivity is not a whole um, um, not, uh, not a whole thing. It, it's, it, can have, it can have some relevance to the conditions under which uh, production takes place. I work in a, in a plant where the union, before my time, negotiated a salary sharing um, deal with the company. It did not matter whether the company earned four million dollars or twelve cents. If they earned twelve cents, the workers got a portion of that twelve cents. Mm. <clears throat> the capitalists lost money and the workers are not getting what they needed to get for one, which was four million dollars, and they got ten percent of four million dollars, and they went up to twelve percent in my in my lifetime. In, the, in one contract, two percent more than before. That's exercising productivity. The position that the Communist Party took is that that's company unionism. Not necessarily. It could be uh, uh, understood as a result of a struggle. You know, the athletic, uh, I mean, the professional sports teams have very elaborate uh, things about that in terms of the gate, especially in the National Basketball Association. Yeah, yeah. They get a Which is a much more players, players league. Players league. Compared to the right, football. Right, right. When Marvin Miller negotiated the abolition of the reserve clause. Everybody knows what the reserve clause is right now. No. It's un-American if you don't know that. I'm just <laughs> It's un-American if you don't know that. <laughs> That's right. but, but, but the victory was stupendous. It's stupendous for the, for the baseball players. Before Miller's negotiation of the abolition of the Reserve Clause, the Reserve Clause was in effect, which meant that the company reserved ownership, in effect, of the workers' wages and benefits and other working conditions for the lifetime of that worker in the company and in the league. The name of the player very often was flood. Kurt Flood <laughs> for the St. Louis Cardinals. Kurt Flood <laughs> the floodgates opened. Yes. <laughs> Miller did the negotiating with Kurt Flood standing, sitting next yeah. to him. And so today there's no reserve clause. The, uh, co the, the company, the, that is to say the owners do not own the worker. There's a, a, a certain period of time when they, the, the worker has to serve. But the owner does not, after that, the worker is free. 
which has forced the owners into very long-term contracts, which are projected, you know, where guys like Robinson Cano at the Mets have a contract, you know, until they're 40 years old, which was unheard of years right. ago. Yeah, 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 which is very interesting in that regard. And you forgot to mention that you missed your calling vis-a-vis Martin Marvin Miller. Yeah, Stanley could have been the players' union, so, uh, you know. <laughs> I was <laughs> off the and John was his assistant. Maybe they still want you. No, you were you were what now? Oh, yeah. Huh? You were you were. What was your position? At the time, I was a union okay. janitor, and Miller, Miller's <laughs> wife was active in the West Side uh, Committee, which was fighting over New York, and I was part of it because I lived in Eighty Fourth. Jane Jacobs too, right? What? Jane Jacobs was in that group. No. No, not in that group. That was a while or another. So we're fighting, we're fighting together um, against reserve clauses, against housing discrimination, against tearing down houses and building luxury houses. Yeah. And we won a partial victory of the 4,000 units of housing that they built at that time. 2,000 of them were devoted to affordable housing, the terms of which were negotiated. Mm. Now we talk about affordable housing yeah. as if it's God's gift to us. Of course, nobody talks about how much is the rent. The rent on affordable housing today mm. is uh, in, in excess of $700,000 a month. It requires a six-figure income for a family. Yeah. For, 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 um, oh, six, no, that's, that's, that's medium. That's the medium version. That's a hundred, that's a thousand dollars a month. And that's minimum. <coughs> No, it's true that, that um, Bruce and Brooklyn is going to have to set aside a certain number of uh, affordable units. Uh, Bruce Ratner, that person. Right. Yeah. Don't knock our backers. Yeah, I'm just kidding. And it's <laughs> also true that Donald J. Trump and his family has to set aside a certain number of units from up to 50%. 20 or something. 30 years later. And it won't be 50% in Ratner's case either. Well, it's separate entrances too. Yeah. You, know, you have a new apartheid. Four doors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, really? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Four door. Yeah. And they will be allowed to well, but in the case of Brennan, it's 80-20. Yeah. And uh, the champion of the black poor, Bertha, negotiated that one. Yeah. 20%. But we were much stronger. Of course, we relied less on individuals. in both apartments on the west side, the west side uh, apartments are affordable housing today. They are $1,500 for two bedrooms. I have a friend who is an organizer for mobilization for years, Ezra Birnbaum, who lives in one of them, who lived in one of them, and he paid about 14 something. They have kids at home. If you don't have kids, it goes up. Could you explain the significance of what Lukacs calls the unity of the dualities? 
one is subject and object. And he also talks about what page? Uh, I didn't write down the page. I made the notes. Well, there's a duality. There's a duality built into ninety percent of all housing in, in, in New York, but in new housing. In other cities, it's 98% or 100%. That duality at the level of rents is that the landlord has complete control over the rent, except that what he would be willing to negotiate with his prospective tenants or the local um, development agency, which often consists of uh, low-end rich, rich people who make essentially a, a quarter of a million and more. I'm oh. talking about Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, not New York City. Here's one page where from a previous class, but it's um, what well, we read before, but I didn't understand on page 321. At the bottom of the page, he says, this affinity can ultimately be traced back to a similar view of the duality of existence and consciousness, is to the failure to comprehend their unity as a dialectical process, well, yeah. as the process of history. That's right. You can't set one standard. I'm just making our annual expression. You can't stand one. You can't set one standard for rents. For poor people, middle-income people, and wealthy people. So we have three, three standards in the same apartment building of rent. I think you know what, that, that, that really is a problem. On the one hand, you may be subjecting that building to entrance by people who actually make uh, $400 a month or from the 100,000 that are homeless or living with families, that's what it is in New York City. The number of poor people, that is people who make less than a comfortable living standard in New York City, is a couple of million. We have about 8 million people, it's at least 25%. And people who are, who are earning just about enough money to keep their heads above more and water by paying the money. That's probably half the city. Half the city. precisely the same work, making diff different wages. Because one of them has its certificate from a community college, and the union has 
sanctified their status as a carpenter or as a plumber or as an iron worker and the other doesn't. The other is called temporary. And you could be temporary for 50 or 20, maybe 20 years. And the, 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 other, the worker with the credential, uh, it's called permanent. The presumption is the permanent worker is more competent. And the temporary worker is not. But they're doing exactly the same work. That is the antinomy. Credentialism is one of the primary antinomies of bourgeois thought. It's not a secondary antinomy simply because most people don't have college education, college degrees or graduate degrees. It's an antinomy because the hierarchical system has become more and more arbitrary, and yet it's maintained assiduously. In the City University of New York, among almost all universities around the country, a PhD buys you an assistant professorship. Less than a PhD buys you an instructorship. You're teaching exactly the same class, but the one with the uh, credential produces books and articles and will have fewer classes to teach and will have more jobs to come. So where, where would you see tenure in this time going forward? Well, I mean, and there is the tenure is in uh, a job property, right? Yeah, right. Ten, tenure, tenure is the wage of the worker who managed to uh, hang on for seven years and uh, write a book or uh, an article that is approved by the department and then by the uh, executives of the university. Um, it is also very arbitrary. My student, Lynn Chancellor, worked seven, six years, seven years at uh, Bonnet College. She wrote um, two books at that time, and she didn't get tenure. <laughs> One of the books titled was Sadomasochism in Everyday yeah, Life. Right. Uh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just felt this part. My colleague who worked on social text, which one of his founders really, Andre Stephenson, got tenure after one six year period. And in six years he was going to tenure. He still has got tenure, he's a full professor now. And he's got one book, two books. The second book, can see, uh, nobody knows the name, including me. The first book was about George Cannon, which was excellent, right? But uh, Lynn's class, Sato Masochism in Everyday Life, Lynn's book was no less excellent. The same people made the decision not to give her the tenure, but to give him the tenure because they liked the fact that he was writing about power. Which also, you know, raises the question of the presumption that you bring on this width of competence and excellence, yeah. you know, going forward. Well, so tenure follows from that also, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah where is she now, do you know? She's the chairman of sociology at the Graduate Center. She's the she's the chair of the sociology program. At the time when she was asked to be a candidate for the, the, uh, the job, the presumption was if you lost people because of retirement, death, or they quit, the university would replace those jobs in the same department, either on a one-to-one -one basis or two or one basis, but you all you have at least one or two of those three jobs. That that promise no longer exists. So by the time that she went into the program, she had no guarantees of anything having to do with 
the ability of the program to pick jobs. And I had lined up uh, with some help from friends uh, in the uh, uh, university and elsewhere uh, a couple of candidates and hopefully one of them would get at least one of the job, one of the jobs and you could work your way into a second job because they had said none. And uh, she was so busy being chair with uh, detail that she couldn't fight for anything. Mm -hmm. She's still there. Now she's got three books and she's working on a fourth book. But she's a full professor and was chair of Hunter College's program. So it's okay she didn't get tenure at Barnard? Well, the story has it that way now. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, not it's okay. Goes to, it's not okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. It's not okay. You don't mean that. She did all right. She did okay. She did. Look, men would do okay anyway. Mm -hmm. But the point is, what's going on in Barnard and every university and universities all over the country, then they're sticking to the rule that you don't get hired as a tenured professor unless you are already a tenured professor in another institution. Fred Jameson got fired at Harvard. He had all the yeah, he had he had his, his degree from Yale. Cornell West too, right? What? Cornell West also, right? Cornell West too. Um, my opinion of Cornell's situation is it's much more ambiguous than Fred's. Uh, Fred had a book based on his dissertation. Plus he had another book finished and it was in a publisher and the publisher said it was almost per perfectly ready to go. But couldn't commit it. They split, they split that book, right? What? They split it. It's, it's two books. Yeah, yeah. Said, yeah. I was about yeah. to say, yeah. Yeah. the book contained a Marxism and form and the prison house of language. So they split the prison house of language from Marxism and form. Now, it may have been that Fred reduced, refused them when he was um, turned down at Harvard. His first book was, however, published while he was at Harvard. It was called Sartre and Style. The Origins, the Origins of a Style. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's a good book. And Marxism and Four is a superb book although I disagree with one or two of the chapters, it's, uh, it's heads and shoulders above what 90% or more of English professors looking for tenure would have been able to produce. He went to France and became a Marxist of a Sasuke variety. Um, it's all Germans, though, in Marxism and form. Yes. <laughs> what? It's all Germans yes, in Marxism and form. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. But he also a new German. Right. Um, right. He, he, he wrote a, um, a chapter on Benjamin called Benjamin and Style. Hmm. Nostalgia. nostalgia. Benjamin and Nostalgia. I didn't mean style, I meant nostalgia. He's right about Benjamin and about the tenth of his work. I don't think Benjamin can be uh, called mainly somebody who's interested in nostalgia. I don't think Benjamin is able to pass his nostalgia. But at that time, the, the concept of redemption was not really thought out. Well, it was a Jewish uh, yeah, 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 messianic yeah, yeah, concept. Yeah, that's the concept, right, right. But Benjamin went on to write more or maybe wrote more and what was not available at the time, in which he said, and he said in his central essays, that uh, one of the main tasks of the um, writer is to resuscitate those 
parts of the past that were unachieved and the right parts and did you to try to achieve them? That's to play blast open the continuum of yeah. history so that the dialectic imaging That's can right. take place. You know, you know, a little beautiful phrase. Yeah. He had previously been turned down um, in his German dissertation for uh, the origins of human drama. drama. Which is a pretty good book. <laughs> yeah, you could probably get tenure in most places if that's what today? That book today. I doubt it. I, they wouldn't understand it. What is this? <laughs> this is part of the problem. I got tenure. I got tenure and promoted on false, on false promises. promises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I became a full professor though, mm -hmm. without any any ado, except I had to get past committees. But so what was the ambiguity with Cornell? Cornell. Well, you mentioned yeah. well, Cornell. Uh, Cornell has uh, 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 written a dissertation which became a book. Oh, no. no, the Marxism. ethical foundations of Marxist thought. Yeah. Uh, right. 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 The ethical, ethical foundations. Yes, you have them. Huh? Ethical. Yeah. Yes. The ethical foundations. The ethical foundations of Marxist thought. Right. Ethics. Oh, the ethical foundations of Marxist thought. So. Right. And he was well on the way to finishing the book on American philosophy, which was uh, his criticism of American philosophy, particularly pragmatism, which he had been attracted to as a younger person, uh, a newer person. And they didn't give him tenure. He went to uh, UC San Diego without tenure, but it was the presumption was that he would get it and he got it right away. And he also believed that a, a, a job at Yale was worth more than a job at San Diego. Nobody would pay as much attention to him at San Diego as they did because he was a Yale professor, which he quit very fast. Right? You're talking about Jameson now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Oh. Okay. And he was living in the house in yeah. okay. yeah. California. I said, Fred, that's a, that's, uh, that was true. I got and we're yeah, we got it. Anybody <laughs> We went from Cornell to Jameson there. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, that's okay. No, no, sorry. Cornell yeah. was never hired because of his work. Right. He was never hired because of his work. Why was he let go? Yeah. Because they were, they were, uh, they were following the rule. His, he didn't have enough, uh, didn't have a, uh, a solid book finished and published, uh, except his participation was did not necessarily count. That's a South book, too. Mm -hmm. uh, You're back at Jameson, yeah. yeah. What? But yeah, but. I know, but I said yeah. his book. No, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, the ethical foundations of, of uh, yeah. Marxian philosophy was not considered a book. Uh, right. Uh, it was considered his dissertation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wrote my first, uh, I wrote my dissertation. Um, Two years after my first book was published, mm. <laughs> I was already appointed a full professor. Yeah. Wonderful way of doing things, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I made a colossal mistake in that time. <laughs> 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 a major mistake. Yeah. Absolutely. And the major mistake was 
They thought I was a labor expert, and that was what they hired me for. He's going to help the help the help the generations. We're in this first when, when, when Stanley uh, was yeah. uh, invited to go to uh, uh, Hudson Community College in New Jersey mm -hmm. through a mutual friend of ours, Michael Ferlise, mm -hmm. you know, the committee, when he's, he's saying, I'm bringing Stanley Arano with us, kind of one time, isn't he for proletarian revolution? <laughs> 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 we don't want <lie> yet. <laughs> so Ferlise says, well, what's wrong with that, anyway? <laughs> Michael for least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Somebody in the hit me for a proletarian revolution. <laughs> Marx goes back and forth on that issue, you know. Marx. Yes. Yes. He never, he, does. That's true. he never really seriously proposed the right. proletarian yeah. revolution. Right. Mm. He always he always yes. allowed for coalitions. Yes. He said, however, the power cannot be vested in the coalition. The coalition has to be based on working class uh, advocacy and willing to fight for the revolution. Well, we could always say the radical imagination is anarcho-communism, not just, you know, quote, a, a communism, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Well, Marx, Marx is view of anarchism and his own relationship to anarchism was conditioned on Proudhon yeah. and other anarchists for some time. Yeah. Yeah. As is true always. Um, I don't believe that at the end of his life he was as um, down on anarchism right. as he was on, as the anarchists. Right. Because a lot of what he held because he interpreted as anarchistic. Okay. He, he was, he, it was only at the, um, in the in these 1870s that he came out for this thing. And really broke more with the anarchists then, right? Yeah. Broke more conceptually. Conceptual. 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 Yeah, yes. conceptual. Right. So we are taking a, a lot different yeah. form right. and the right. concept of anarchism won, mm -hmm. went out more. Well, yes. Oh, we, do we have two more weeks? God knows what we have. I hope I don't want to yeah, we could do we that. Could yeah, do I mean, you know, we. Yeah, I, I'm going to. I'm going to arrange the best I can. I already had a talk with her to go back to the People's Forum, but I'll let everybody know. She's supposed to let me know by Monday. You know, okay. so I'll check your emails about location next week. Mm -hmm. But we could do it again here, and I, I'm. I'm. I'll, I'll, you know, I'm definitely here too. So. So you know, yeah, it's fun. Possible. Uh, so we're talking Memorial Day weekend. Uh, that's next that weekend, the twenty fourth, twenty fifth. Saturday. I, know, I, can't and make, I can't make the first. Okay. Well, maybe Whatever. we can do the eighth or the fifteenth. Maybe we can no, figure out something going forward because I'm probably not going to be here the first either. But we definitely yeah, okay. are scheduled for next week, and okay. I will, that you know, good. inform you know Josh, who's been. Really on point to put it mildly in terms of all these changes, and uh, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, so I should know by Monday evening at the latest, okay. Tuesday morning maybe at the latest about that location for next week. You know, whether or not. Yeah. I think whether or not it'd be people's fault. Yeah, I think we're going to do um, now. Oh, do the uh, invisible committee? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I might have to find a PDF of that, maybe with Josh well, and I. Well, I would be for free. That. Otherwise, it's ten dollars. Yeah, it's ten dollars from Simeo Text. It's a kind of a, it's a very interesting way where a lot of the, it's really from the standpoint of the younger people that are tired of the old theories. The and, book is you know, now. now. Yeah, yeah, I have it's a copy. The invisible community. Yeah, when we went up yeah. and heard the yeah. Yeah. forum and at Columbia. Um, so we're going to read that for next week. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. It's, it's there are 69 pages. Okay. Yeah. The book is called Now, and it's, it's a wrap. It's a long wrap, but it's, it's interesting. written by the committee. Yeah. And you might send it as a PDF? Uh, I'm going to try to find it. Yeah, I think There's a PDF. There I was reading okay. it on, right. the, on a PDF okay. before right. I we'll send PDF yeah. to the okay. website. To the website. Yeah. Yeah, they they would not be a group um, to restrict it. APPS. Would they? 
PDF. PD, PDF. No, PDF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. PDF would be on your website. Yeah, we'll we'll get it up on the website. Yeah, yeah. On whose website? On the Institute for Radical Imagination. So nobody has to pay ten dollars. Nobody has to pay ten dollars. <laughs> this is what happens to leftist movement sometimes. Nobody pays. You don't have to. <laughs> you don't Part have of the problem. We don't get arms, you know, <laughs> because of this. <laughs> Do you have another copy of Age of Anxiety? Um, no, but they've been ordered. I tried ordering come. it from. Uh, from London. Alex. We'll get them. Uh, we'll talk to and, Peter uh, later they, today. They didn't deliver, and okay. finally, I just canceled yeah. the order. Okay, I'll, I'll, I will uh, we'll speak to Peter about that, yeah, yeah. I would, I would suggest that if you had time, read both the, uh, uh, both the, um, the, 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 the little book now and also the last section of uh, verification. It's about what we should do. The standpoint of the proletariat? Yeah. This is a more, I've read this maybe now about 12 times. Each time I learn something more. Mm. I want to say, this stands the test of time. Yeah. This, That's this, good this to thing. know. No, it really yeah. does. It really does. No, it really does. And the, the density, the density, the density, the density is, is really there. The level of the underlying story, it's amazing. It's a beautifully crafted piece on the formal level as an essay, you know, judging it just as an essay and thought, you know, as well as, you know, the content. It's amazing what he does with Spinoza the Hegel. Yeah. Which is another, you know, aspect of this, not only uh, the antinomies, but what he does with the order of ideas and things <laughs> in nature, and then why history is necessary to think through. I mean, there are just I'm many, just many levels man. here, you know, that are going to my head. Career. So, uh, yeah, he's not, he, he wrote the American Invasion of Philosophy, uh, which I read in advance and told him that I thought the Du Bois chapter should be excised or severely edited. He said, I don't have the time. And he reminded me of people who don't have the time. Mm -hmm. And he has not written a book since, except the books on race, which are essentially, uh, which are not books. He read us. He wrote another small book or pamphlet called "Democracy on Matters." Democracy, race democracy matters. matters. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Magazine, race matters. He, de he dedicated he democracy, matters democracy Matters to his family. Oh, is that right? Mm. I have that all. Mm -hmm. And blacks and Jews <laughs> let the healing begin. Right. He's so <laughs> much. He's so much smarter than his books, by the way, including the American invasion of philosophy. Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when I you talk to Cornell, it's much more deeper than reading them. Yeah. I was really, really surprised yeah. at the depth mm -hmm. of his intervention at the class that I missed. I was sorry I missed the one that he went to, but I was really impressed mm -hmm. with what he said mm -hmm. about this material and about Stanley's book, mm -hmm. The Crisis mm -hmm. in Historical mm -hmm. Materialism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which that was a chapter on narcissism. That was way beyond what I expected. Well, Stanley's Cornell Necessity was. of Philosophy in that book kind of, you know, is, is a nice companion to the American In the crisis. Yeah, in the crisis, the crisis right, is a nice companion to the American invasion of philosophy in a kind of the very American different way. Invasion. invasion of philosophy, yeah. 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 Can you understand this if you're not well-versed in Kant, if you're not well-versed well in Well, I think it gives you a deeper, right? you can understand, I mean, it depends on the level of understanding. I mean, for me, it's always a pleasure to go back because he's, he's so philosophically sophisticated and, and, and deep in terms of his understanding, which makes him look harsh to, to my mind. You know, he's not just another Marxist who's very smart, who is way, you know, but he's really immersed in, you know, the, the notions of order of things, connections among things, ideas and things, you know, antinomies. He's able to use this in such an original, creative and duality. way. Yeah, and duality of, you know essence and appearance and he uses it in such an original way that this is a, yeah, yeah, this is yeah. seminal. I mean it's yeah. seminal, I mean to put it mildly. And I think this book, I mean as Stanley has pointed out many times, has influenced the Frankfurt School 
to where people have forgotten how much the Frankfurt School were really inf influenced they by launched the, the Adorno. It launched them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. really? It launched. It launched they everything. Launched. It launched everything. Yeah. So that's why it's still crucial to read whether you think you know he has a wrong notion of the expressive totality versus this work. There are a lot of issues around this that have come up in the in the literature. But you know, again, it's 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 a landmark. I mean, you know, it's yeah. a, it's, it's, a, it's foundational. You know, in, in a sense. And should be foundational in the curriculum uh, for any kind of alternative educational institution. Yeah, alongside the reading of the cons, you know, that's broken down. His, by the way, his uh, his his friend. I mean, his someone who followed Bukowski early, Lucien Beaumont, wrote a very good uh, uh, introduction to Kant. I don't know if it's in English. It's in French. Do you know if it's in English? The book on Kant that Goldman wrote? I, I'm not, I'm, yeah, no, it's I'm not, not in English. It's not in English. It's only in French. But a very, very, very good book, you know, presence on, on, on Emmanuel Kant. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. Unless it's been published in the last couple of years. Yeah, no, it hasn't. No, he has no, you know, <laughs> nobody's working on this yet, unfortunately. You know, in what yeah, I read, yeah, yeah. where he talks about the rational system, the rational systemization of life, um, all the statutes re regulating life, the lack of any. Once that formalism is introduced, that honors the specificity, the individual. That reminded me of the Lazzarato. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. He had he had a presence among the Italian school too. I mean, you know, Lukács. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And it was also in, in warfare his whole life. That's another thing. I mean, that's that's the amazing thing about Lukács. You know. I read a story well, about him that um, when he was arrested and asked to surrender his arm, he pulled out his pen. He pulled out his pen, but he yeah. has to call and carry a revolver. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Well, apparently, he was armed. the point of this was that. <laughs> they knew he was armed, <laughs> but he pulled out One of his arms was, yeah. 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 So, yeah. But it was, to my mind, this was really some generation, when you think about this, you know. I mean, Sard, Levi Strauss, and Simone de, de, de Beauvoir are all just going to school now, and he's writing this, and you know, in the early 20s, wow. you know, and it's pretty, pretty amazing. But, uh, yeah, yeah. And kind of came out of that, that period. You know what I see where the literature is? It's where the contradictions of the individual and our head's relation to various uh, encounters in society, you know, uh, situations in society, are. Um, that is to say that uh, the individual is not, according to Lukács, is not a, uh, is not a, uh, a solitary thing. Notice the solitary everywhere. Uh, the individual is caught up in those social relations and the uh, great novelists, whether they're aware of it or not, portray those social relations, those social relations is fundamental to the formation of individuals. And uh, that includes Balzac and Thomas Mann and uh, uh, I don't know, does he have So Walter Scott in the so historical Walter novel. Scott, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 Um, but he didn't do anything on uh, Well, he was anti-modernist, which no, always he kept him outside of the, uh, yeah, nothing on Joyce or sentimental education. Sentimental education, Flaubert, yeah, 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 yeah. No, nothing on modernism. Yeah, no, no. But the essay on lost illusions is a classic for Balzac. Yeah, Lucien uh, Rampe. But what's interesting is that. Dr. Faustus, which is his, uh, Thomas Mann's last novel, can be appropriated both by the Frankfurt School, both by Lukács and by Bozak's uh, other uh, uh, admirers, which would be the, uh, uh, the uh, straight Marxists.
What do you think all of Hansel has been excluded from the class? You know, did I tell you Bob Cantor taught his course, his part of a core course, taught the social history of art? Four volumes? All four volumes to his, uh, his master's program, which he's now given up. He's, he's retired from SVA. But, yeah. He's retired? Yeah, he did retire, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to write. So we'll see if we'll get that translation, finally. Anyway. <laughs> But, but anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, he, he's taught it, but no, I don't think Hauser. Did you ever read uh, Arnold Hauser's Social no. History? For, yeah, so, yeah, Hauser was part of that I did. generation. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. And it was published in a major publishing house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Certainly read by Meyer Shapiro. <laughs> Meyer was no slouch. No, I don't tell me about it. You know what I discovered? That he was the policy review. Didn't I say the policy review had a, uh, a symposium on the Second World War? Mm -hmm. And there were two people selected to discuss it. One was Sidney Hook, pro war. Meyer should be our anti war. Anti war. Well, right. Straightforward Trotsky. Yes, yes. yeah attack against yeah. you know, the Second Imperialist War. That was a hard position to hold. Paul Maddock held that, right. Panikok held that. Right. We'll see you later? Huh? Okay, okay. Uh, Josh, if you're going down with me, we'll catch a cab since we're running. What time is your 2.30, we'll, we'll catch a cab. We've got 15.